Good evening. Welcome to Interface. My name is Tembi Samachele. South Africa's transition to democracy is celebrated worldwide and often referred to as a miracle. But little of what happened during apartheid can be described as a miracle. While South Africa's fight for liberation captured the world, one man was meticulously working behind the scenes to accelerate change. His story, which he worked hard to keep out of the public, has been made into a documentary. Plot for Peace tells the story of Algerian-born Frenchman and businessman Jean-Yves Olivier, and he negotiated peace with apartheid government officials. Now, before we introduce our guests tonight, let's have a look at this excerpt from the documentary, Plot for Peace. A new South Africa has to eliminate the racial hatred and offer guarantees to all. Nelson Mandela a gagné. L'ex-prisonnier va devenir président. Il va libérer le pays de l'apartheid de son enfermement. C'est ça l'histoire avec un grand H. Une histoire qui est en fait la somme de beaucoup de petites histoires. Pour la mienne. Avec mes amis, dans les pays de la ligne de front, nous avons fait taire les armes pour que l'apartheid puisse mourir en paix. Je suis moi-même ce jour-là dans le sable de Soweto. Mandela ne sait rien de moi. Rien de mon histoire secrète qui pourtant se mélange à la sienne. Qu'importe, les cartes se sont parfaitement alignées. La partie est finie. Je pense que Jean-Yves Olivier, de toute façon, appartenait à, au service français. The chance of being a double agent who didn't care about this. When you have a man like Jean-Yves, nothing will leak, but the results will be brought about. And that's what he did. He would have played whatever other role, but not, not a political one. What he was looking for, I'm not sure, because he never asked me money. Il y a des moments où la politique doit être plus souple. Et pour être souple, elle a besoin de secret. The mysterious businessman, codenamed Monsieur Jacques, played a leading role in the delicate negotiations which led to the multiple prisoner swap in Maputo, Mozambique earlier this year. He was one of the first to figure out the great secret of Africa. Personne n'est au courant de ce que je fais. J'étais tout seul. Well, that's just part of this documentary that we're talking about today, and that is the documentary called Plot for Peace. And let's welcome our guest, Dr. Matthew Sporza, who is a businessman, and Ivo Itchkovitz, who is with the Itchkovitz Family Foundation. Mandy Jacobson is a filmmaker and also a producer of the documentary. Welcome to all of you. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for inviting us. Dr. Sporza, let's start with this particular aspect. Our democracy or our transition into our democracy, we all or most of us hail it as this great miracle. And now we're getting this idea that maybe it wasn't so much of a miracle. How much work went into this transition behind the scenes? If you one takes into account what happened before April 94, then what happened, what gave birth to our democracy is a miracle. Mm. But there was chaos before that. Take in South Africa, the country was totally ungovernable. There was international sanctions. The economy was on a nosedive. We ate each other's throats, black and white. There was bombs exploding all over. In Angola, there was a war. The Cubans were there fighting uh, on the side uh, of Angolans against South African forces and against UNITA. In Namibia, there was chaos. There was no independence. Mm. So what preceded um, our independence? was peace in Angola, the withdrawal of the Cubans, the withdrawal of South African forces, peace in Namibia, independence of Namibia, new democracy born in Namibia, and later, to our pleasure, new South Africa born. They, these things are all connected. But why is it that we've focused so much on the, the new South Africa is born, we've done so much, uh, there was less bloodshed, 
than what was expected. So let's focus on that. Did we need to tell that story so that we could foster peace more than the story of what was happening in the frontline states? The death of one person is a calamity. Sure. And too many people died on our soil. Too many people died on the soil of Namibia, Angola, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, and everywhere else. There's no death which is worth nothing. So all those who died for peace today, we can say, for democracy, it was not in vain. But that's the price we paid, blood. Mm. So, Mandy, how did you stumble across this particular story? Well, I think my great privilege is to work for Ivor Echikovitz's mm. foundation, and one of the arms is a heritage initiative. And the whole point of that heritage initiative is to say, it, we might refer to South Africa as a miracle, but actually it was people that came together to make a difference, to change history. And that's what we're trying to do. We are collecting the testimonies of the very real players and maybe some of the unknown people mm. that have contributed towards that march. So in collecting these testimonies, we discovered a really curious bit of footage out of the SABC archives about a mysterious businessman called Monsieur Jacques. And that led us to a whole other story. He was referred to as Monsieur Jacques, who had helped release Van Antetoy, a former South African defense recce, I suppose, who was fighting on our borders clandestinely. So that trying to go and uncover that story raised a whole other question about what mm. was the role of regional efforts. We had been at war for 20 years, so how were people coming together at that level? And that started a whole other story. And I think the point is that Ivor often says it, it's about people coming together. And the message of this film is to say, let's look at the human values, mm. what brought people together to negotiate their way out of the, this crisis. So Ivor, what did this particular individual, uh, Monsieur Jacques, what did he do? What is his story? Monsieur Jacques' story is, as Mandy has said, is one of many stories. Sure. And, and, and I think the challenge and the privilege in collecting the archival material that we have is that we've identified that the making of the modern South Africa didn't come about just because of one event or one story or one set of people. Mm. And what we identified in Monsieur Jacques was here was an individual, one human being, who managed to get a whole group of people talking to each other. And I've always been a great proponent for the fact that we as Africans are fantastic communicators mm. for as long as we've got the opportunity to communicate. And so often misunderstandings are created because relationships don't exist. And what fascinated Mandy and myself about Monsieur Jacques' story, Jean-Yves Olivier's story, was that he was able to cross the cultural and political divides mm. and get people talking to each other. Mm. And through talking to each other, they found each other at a human level, mm. not at a political level or a tactical level, at a human level. Mm. And through that human interaction, they managed to solve incredibly difficult problems. And I think if there's any great lesson out of this story, it's that for as long as people are talking, there are resolutions to problems. There's hope. And we'd love to hear how exactly you went about doing that. But we've got to take a short break. When we come back, we continue this discussion. Remember, you can find us on Twitter at Tembi Samachele or at Interface on SABC. Stay with us. to interface we're talking about the documentary plot for peace and also looking at just our transition into democracy and how much work went on behind the scenes and we're continuing this conversation about that but just talking about Monsieur Jacques uh, Ivo before the break what we were I wanted to ask was exactly how did he do that how did he bridge the divide the cultural divide the racial divide so he was he, he is Johnny Olivier is a very unique human being he really is a remarkable individual he'd lived through the crisis in Algeria, he'd been, uh, he'd experienced the political transformations elsewhere in Africa, he developed relationships through, he was a trader, he was a serial trader, and uh, through, he, he, he developed relationships throughout Africa, throughout his life, and he realized that those relationships would have some value towards unfolding a set of circumstances that would ultimately result in forcing the Nationalist Party government to move towards freeing Nelson Mandela. Mm. So 
there was a sequence of events that had to happen. The war in Angola had to come to an end. Vainant du Toy had to be released. Vainant du Toy was a, a very huge political problem for, for the South African government. And P.W. Boerter at one stage said, if you want me to release Nelson Mandela, why is Vainant du Toy not being released? Mm. So Jean-Yves Olivier said, hang on, this is the gap I need. If I can get Vainant du Toy released, then P.W. Boerter is in a bind and he has to start working towards mm. releasing Nelson Mandela. Something as simple as that. Mm. Now, crazy idea, but it just needs one man to believe that it can be done. Mm. And the story that Plot for Peace tells is how that one man then went and did it. It's one thing to have an idea. It's another thing to have the contacts. It's a third thing to have the guts to go and do it. And what I think that, um, what I found fascinating in the story and why I felt that the foundation needed to tell the story is that there really is a message here. We as Africans often believe that we don't have a voice. We don't have the ability to change our own reality. And nothing can be further from the truth. Mm. Plot for Peace proves that one man can make a difference. And Johnny Olivier did so. Please let's not be under any illusions here. Johnny Olivier did not free Nelson, free Nelson Mandela. Mm. This is just one of the stories that led to a process that resulted in the freedom of Nelson mm. Mandela. But there's such an incredible human story here and so much confidence in the fact that one man can make a difference. Dr. Poss, what is the message that we should be putting out there? Because I find that there's a lot of discussion about who played what role and how important was that role. Whereas the story that we should be telling from what I was saying is that a lot of people played a role and a lot of lives were lost like you outlined earlier. But is there any value in saying this is who freed uh, Nelson Mandela and this is who was responsible for our democracy at the end of the day? I don't think there's any value. There's value in acknowledging the roles played by people like John Eve, making people to talk about peace mm. to start with. Number two, there's a role played by the masses in various countries, South Africa, Namibia, Angola, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Swaziland, Botswana, Lesotho. The people of those countries and the people of the world who stood against apartheid contributed towards the total solution. It didn't happen in one day. It, it was like a stage by stage. But the convergence of their efforts released these countries from bondage. Nelson Mandela was released by, not by himself. A collective effort. By a collective effort uh, of the masses here, of the international community, mm -hmm. which was pressurizing apartheid government to get going towards democracy. But, you know, give Geneva credit. It, someone had to stand up and move from point A to point B to point Z and start the negotiations. Mm. And to, to remind people that you're asking about messages, that violence takes the worst out of us and peace the best out of us. Give peace a chance. And what did, when that happened, when that moment of peace was acknowledged, democracies were born in all these countries. And today we're celebrating mm. 20 years of democracy. The fact that the stories of the role played by the neighboring countries in the freedom of South Africa. That story or those stories have not been told uh, as much as they perhaps should have. Do you think that played a role at all in the xenophobia that we've seen locally uh, uh, taking place every now and again? I think the xenophobia we see in South Africa is fed by ignorance, lack of appreciation of the roles of the various states on the continent which they play towards giving birth to South Africa. They gave us shelter, they gave us military bases, they gave us protection. They gave us food. But they why are we not hearing those stories? We, we are. are. Well, we're starting to now. We're starting to now. This, starting is, to now. this <laughs> is exactly the mission of my foundation. Yeah. This is exactly the work that Mandy and her team are very talented filmmakers. Um, we feel that many of these stories haven't been told. And mm. because many of these stories haven't been told, today's generation of South Africans, today's generation of Africans, because it's not just a problem mm. for South mm. Africa, don't know this history. And this is not ancient history. This is 20 years ago. Yeah. It's yesterday's history. And if we all understood this history, then these xenophobic issues would be less of an issue. So why has it taken 20 years to start telling these very pertinent stories? 
I think the stories are always being told, and I think there's different platforms to tell these stories. We're in the privileged position of having engaged with frontline leaders, and in fact, Dr. Pauzer is very much in that film as well, which is called Tribute to Frontline States, which is being shown on SABC during Heritage Month. There's so many different stories that help us engage with our heritage, that make us think about nation building mm. as a project. It's an ongoing story, and we never want to create the idea that there's only one story. So I think there are a lot of stories being told. The question is getting them out there. That's right. But also it's an issue of timing. You know, you must remember that South Africa has gone through a very tumultuous um, 20 years. We've had so many internal issues to be concerned about. We've had so much stuff we've had to deal with that history hasn't been all that important. Now at this point, at the point where we have a new generation of leaders coming through the system, a new generation of leaders who have no real identification with this history, this new generation of leaders wasn't born in 1994. Now we need to really be telling these stories. Mm. And it's part of the motivation that, that we have mm. to be doing this now. Because a lot of the people, or all of the testimony we have is original testimony. You couldn't tell Johnny Olivia's story if Winnie Mandela wasn't around and Matthew Pauza wasn't around and uh, Chisano wasn't around and Chester Crocker wasn't around to verify their stories. Mm. But these stories also couldn't have been told 10 years ago because these people didn't want to talk 10 years ago. Why not, Dr. Pauza? Well, I don't know. In the, you're talking about uh, many stories not being told. If I was to tell what pains me as a member of the African National Congress, is that many of our leaders have died without writing books. Absolutely. Mm. And that history is lost. Mm. And a call to say, let's record what happened. Not, not because you want personal glory, but mm. because you want to learn from the lessons of history. Mm. Ivo is doing the right thing with the foundation, a very special contribution towards history, towards uh, 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 enriching our memories and, and making us know where we come from. Not only as South Africans, but as mm. Africans on the continent. And there's plenty more stories where this one came from, and we hope to hear a whole lot more. But give us your thoughts on our uh, Twitter page, uh, at Interface or at Tembisa Machele. Give us your thoughts. What do you think of the transition and how much that uh, went into it, how much work went into uh, getting our freedom up and running? Give us your thoughts and also stay tuned as we take another short break and we come back and wrap up this conversation. Welcome back, talking about the documentary Plot for Peace and taking your thoughts. Our Facebook page is also up and running. It's Interface on SABC2 and also on Twitter at Tembi Samachele or at Interface on SABC, wrapping up this conversation now. Dr. Poz, just over two weeks ago on this program, we spoke about the parole decision for Eugene de Kock and we had victims in the studio telling their stories mm. and what came across so much and so strongly even on our uh, social media was just how angry mm. people mm. still are and people feel that their stories have not been told they feel that many of them have not been acknowledged for the role that they have played in or their families at least have played in the struggle for democracy mm. why do you think that a lot of those stories on the ground have not been told yet well, because uh, much as we must appreciate the initiative of Truth and Reconciliation Commission, mm. it was a, a novelty in uh, peacemaking in the world mm. in, in a special way. It did not cover all the victims. And there's too many of them out there who still feel their voices were not heard, their pains were not shared. But we should not play to that if we want to lead this country. We should continue to let their voices be heard. In the How? case of Eugene, Eugene, Eugene de Kock, Mm -hmm. It was marvelous to get uh, Portia's daughter going to see Eugene and talking to, to, to Eugene and saying, the man feels sorry. She's saying it, not you and me. You need those moments of engagement and reconciliation. We should create a platform for, for that to happen. And we cannot have permanent punishment in a developed society. Mm. We must reach a point where mm. we're able to forgive and, and move on. Hmm. Ivan? There's a point at which people have to move on. Something amazing happened last week when we had the, the first screening of Plot for Peace in South Africa. We had in the audience Pitbueta, Winnie Mandela, Venant Dutoy, Johnny Bolivia. 
Winnie Mandela got up and she said, I hated you to Vainant du Toy. You were the devil. And now I know you. And she got up and gave him a hug. Now, there were no two people that could have been further apart in terms of the political and ideological divide. And 20 years later, they know each other's stories. They know that they are human, that they, that they are human beings. And they have an empathy for each other. Mm. And they can reconcile. So by getting people talking, by airing the stories, reconciliation is possible. It takes time and it takes communication. And we have to be doing that in this country. We have to be doing that in the world. Mm. I have to play devil's advocate here, so I've got to ask this question. Isn't part of the problem the fact that we are rushing too much to get people to get over you know, what happened to them, to get them to forgive too quickly, to get them to get past it? It's only been 20 years. Is it fair to expect people to have moved on in this time? Well, let me give you a bit of credit. Yes, we were a bit in a hurry for peace. But in the process, we thought all the bricks must come on the wall. Human beings don't behave like that. They're not machines. Mm. And, and it's, it's deep wounds, deep memories. But if we must give leadership on those deep wounds and deep memories, we must channel the anger constructively towards creating a point of reconciliation and cut off and moving on as a nation. We, we have to lead. Mm. And now is the time, because if we don't do it now, the people, the generation will have moved on, and we will leave these scars with future generations. And South Africa can't afford that. Mm. We have to move forward as a reconciled nation. We, we say to ourselves during negotiations, our mission is to impose peace on violence. Yeah. That's what our mission was. And that's, so therefore, if we impose peace on violence, we disarm the Eugene, the Blanches, and all the people who are looking for violence. There's no room for them. Mm -hmm. And we promote democracy, peace, human rights. I love this particular platform of having documentaries that speak to the people. But I'm curious as to what else can be done. We have the TRC process. It did its bit mm -hmm. for its time. But now it feels as though South Africa needs something else. We need another platform where these stories can be aired. What other thoughts are there, you know, in terms of how we can tell these stories? Well, I think one of the remarkable outcomes of the Truth Commission was that public truth-telling was a form of healing was that victims who came forward felt that there was something special in being listened to. So you're right, we do need to explore different forms of public truth-telling and different forms of being listened to. And the national broadcaster plays an incredible part in facilitating that discussion. What we can do in our small space is to say it's not only enough just to have it on television. Mm -hmm. How do we engage with our audiences in all sorts of other ways? And the youth, the younger generation, are driving us and leading us with solutions to take history into the communities and into our classrooms. Mm -hmm. We're running out of time, unfortunately, but I'd love to get some closing thoughts from all of you just on the role of this particular mode of storytelling, uh, the, the documentaries, and also just the path to peace. How far are we from our nirvana as a country, and how far are we from where we need to be? Dr. Possel, let's start with you. P peace is not an event, it's a process. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. You know, you, must, you have to continually impact on the psychology of people, that there's a need to to undermine the divide between black and white, to be seen as people of the same human race, to continue to make people understand the meaning of democracy, how you respect one another is simple interactions, how we promote South African citizenship, and how we relate to other nations and respect them as well. And when you have people here, you don't uh, uh, drag them behind a uh, moving van mm. as if they, are, they, were, they, were, they were charters, mm. that they are human beings. So you become a bit of not a nationalist, but also internationalist. Sure. To understand the context of the world today is global, it's not just local. Mm. So therefore, we need to invest in the values, good values, into the future and teach our children, because they are the new future citizens. Right. I grew up understanding that ideologies never reconcile. Mm. People reconcile. And part of the reason that we're doing this, this work, why the African Oral History Archive exists, is because I realized that any human beings, as much as they hate each other, can find common ground if they open themselves to doing so. And there is no doubt there's a huge amount of work to be done in South Africa. Hatred that is passed down from generation to generation still remains hatred. 
And if we can have dialogues like this, if we can share our stories, both sides of the equation, and people can realize that they have more to achieve by working together mm. than by hating, t hating each other, this country has an incredible future. If we can't achieve that, then we're going to be like hundreds of other societies around the world that have never found peace. Mm -hmm. South Africa will find peace because our next generation will achieve it. And I have complete faith in that. All right. Just quickly then, Mandy, how, when, when is this airing? When do we get to see it? Thank you. Well, we're opening in cinemas at Cinema Nouveau in Rosebank this Friday for a week to see Plot for Peace. And then on SABC2 during Heritage Month, we're rolling out our Rainbow Maker series, of which Plot for Peace is a part of it. So we encourage all your viewers to please tune in during Heritage Month. I'm sure they will. Thank you so much for Thank coming you. through Thank to you. talk to us about this very important documentary and also just the journey to peace in South Africa. We're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much for your time. And also, let's continue the conversation on our Facebook page, Interface on SABC2, and also on Twitter at Timbisamahele or at Interface on SABC. Good night.